Ah, Shashita is here. Okay, perfect. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think we're live now. We've been having a little bit of difficulty as you do that in the digital space, which we will be discussing today. Uh, and we're starting with the issue of distrust. So given how we started, I mean, it's no surprise that we'll be distrustful of or mistrustful of digital system because we couldn't start on time. And I think we have a little bit of difficulty getting all our panelists in as well. Uh, so the distrust is really about global multinationals. It is a problem. We are sandwiched between the 20th century and 21st century as far as multinationals are concerned. We have the older multinationals and we have the new multinationals. And the issue that we'll be talking about today are the three S's, the digital sovereignty needs, uh, social impact issues, and company sustainability strategies. And uh, as we look at the withering of the industrial economy and embrace of the digital economy, uh, depending on inequality, as we are seeing astronomical rise in wealth, we're also seeing very, very large uh, uh, digital divide as well during this during this time. And what we saw during the pandemic was really a widening of that. Uh, we are seeing a decline of the mainstream media. So what is mainstream today, the traditional media and the, and the new global social media. So what is mainstream? Uh, we can define that. The dwindling of trust in traditional institutions, including the government, uh, political ideologies that are clashing in an unprecedented way. And even our definition of truth. So what, what, is, what is true today? What is the truth? I think these are all being, being defined and redefined and uh, redefined on a constant basis. Uh, let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have three panelists. Uh, let me start with uh, Mr. Philip Muller. He's the head of core government, EMEA, at Amazon Web Services. Uh, he has authored uh, several books, three books actually, and articles on the interplay of technology, strategy, and leadership. He has a PhD from Ludwig Maximilians University and was a research fellow at Harvard and a professor at Wiley Brand School of Public Policy, University of Erfurt, and dean of the Business School of Salzburg University. So he has a combination of academia and uh, deep private sector experience. We have our second panelist, who is Mr. Shashi Tharoor. I think I saw him for a second. I'm not able to see him anymore. He chairs the Indian Parliament Standing Committee on IT. He's an MP uh, at Indian Lok Sabha. He's an international diplomat, politician, uh, very well-known writer, and a public intellectual, who has been serving as the member of Indian Parliament since 2009. He was formerly the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and contested for the post of Secretary General in 2006. We have our third panelist, uh, Mr. Sandiaga Salaudinuno. He's the Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy of the Government of Indonesia and a graduate of uh, George Washington University. Uh, Mr. Uno has had a very illustrious entrepreneurial career, uh, a private sector career. And uh, he, he's, he was also an investor uh, in his previous life. Mr. Uno, Uno welcome. Are you, are you able to hear us properly? Yes, I am very, very uh, honored to be here. And thank you for inviting me for this virtual Horasis Asia meeting. Uh, and thank you, Chairman of Horasis, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter for uh, inviting and also Mr. Anir Chaudhuri for uh, welcoming me to this session. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It is also digital that's uh, making you appear from your car. It seems like you're on the move, but you're able to join us. So that's great. Yes. And hopefully Mr. Well, Kirk will be with us uh, on a stable basis very soon. Mr. Thurur, can you hear me properly? I see you uh, occasionally, but not consistently. 
Okay, I, hopefully um, we'll uh, have him soon. My name is Anir Choudhury. Let me just introduce myself. Uh, I'll be chairing and moderating the discussion today. Uh, I am uh, a member of the Bangladesh uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's uh, National Task Force on Digital Transformation. I also run a program called uh, Aspire to Innovate A2I, which is the whole of government uh, digital transformation flagship program of the government of Bangladesh. In a previous life, I also used to be a serial entrepreneur in the US and also in Bangladesh. So I have had a, a career in entrepreneurship and now a public uh, official. Uh, let me start with uh, what global multinationals are. It's not a new concept. I mean, if we look back a couple of hundred years, uh, let me talk about the East India Company. They ran the world at one point. They rose to account for half of the world's trade during the mid 1700s and early 1800s, particularly in basic commodities, including cotton, silk, indigo dye, sugar, salt, spices, tea, and opium. Also, the company seized control of large parts of the Indian subcontinent, colonized part of the Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. Then let me talk about Unilever. Unilever uh, exists in almost all countries. Their products are sold in all, all countries in 400 different brands, uh, 51 billion euros. 13 of their brands actually have sales of over 1 billion euros every year. Then let me talk about Facebook. Uh, roughly 3 billion users worldwide. It's become meta. So it's, it's uh, giving rise to the concept of metaverse now. YouTube has more than 2 billion active users. Uh, now, if we talk about the East India Company, Unilever, Facebook and YouTube, today we're really talking about Facebook and YouTube. No, why not about Unilever? Right, so what, what's, what's so concerning about big tech companies that are not uh, the concern for the, uh, for the conventional global multinationals? Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Mr. Muller. You seem to be the only surviving panelist right now. <laughs> Hopefully the other two panelists will join back. Uh, let me talk about uh, uh, your company, uh, AWS, Amazon. That's a, that's a global multinational. Uh, uh, and I remember uh, a couple of years ago uh, when, I, when I was in a conference in Bangalore, uh, there was uh, a con talk about uh, the next generation fintech. So the next generation fintech for the poor. And there was a report that was uh, revealed there that looked at the countries from the north. So essentially the developed countries and also a country from the south, the developing countries, so to speak. So two parts of the, the report. And it talked about what is the biggest concern from the consumers. The biggest concern that came from the consumers on the, in the developed countries was really privacy. Data, uh, control of data, storage of data, uh, anonymization, all those things came up. GDPR was also discussed there. Uh, the, the biggest concern in the developing countries was not really privacy. I mean, it was there, but not the biggest one. It was really about quality of service. So this is what really prompts us. So the concern that we'd have in terms of sovereignty, uh, what maturity in terms of digitization does a country have to have uh, in terms of talking about privacy concerns? I think that's a, that's a big topic that we debated there. That topic still rages on today. So the question to Mr. Miller. So when you go into a country as, as AWS, or maybe as Amazon, I mean, I, since uh, Amazon is in more countries than AWS possibly uh, in terms of doing business. Uh, so in terms of storage of data, in terms of sovereignty, what issues do you face and how do you negotiate with the, with the host government and what conclusions do you come up with? Thank you for the question and thank you for framing, framing the debate. Um, let me answer in, in two steps. Number one, is um, how we see what we do. And then number two is what is, what is mirrored back to us by our customers, by governments. Um, so, so it does take, take, take a bit of time. So AWS um, is, is a cloud company. What we really do is we offer, we're not like 
a social media company like Facebook or, or YouTube or so. So, so we don't offer services to the end customer. What we offer is a set of um, tools, services, whatever you want to call them, that help um, governments and private sector organizations, anything from startups to big companies, to offer their services to um, their customers. So we really, we think of ourselves as um, a place where builders, people who want to build um, better citizen services, people who want to bring schools online during times of COVID crisis, people who want to, um, who want to um, set up um, the management, the, the digital management tools in order to ensure that, that um, populations are inoculated, vaccinated. And, um, and, and, and these types of tools so that empower private sector and governmental um, organizations to actually get stuff done. So, so in a way, what we offer is functionality at fingertips. Now, in these COVID times, that seems like that's what we really need. And the beauty of it, the service is essentially the same quality in, in Bangladesh as it is in, 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 in New York um, or in, in, in the United States. Um, because, because essentially the same types of services available globally. Now, obviously, this links to like the quality of the of the the network connection, et cetera, et cetera. But but basically, that's that's our value proposition, and this is something that's been quite useful um, um, during this these crazy last last two years. Mm -hmm. Now, however, now and now coming to 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 your question, when we talk to our customers, we're experiencing that. Um, that they say, um, before we talk about the specific offering that you have that allows us to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. we want to talk about topics that you've mentioned. We want to talk about what happens to our data. Data protection is part of that. Data privacy is part of that, but also control over data. Um, secondly, they want they want to talk to us nowadays about sustainability, and there's there's two types of questions they're asking. There is a, how sustainable are you, and are you moving to carbon zero? And the second question they're asking, how can you help us move to carbon zero? And the third question they're asking, and I think you've alluded to it, is um, well. Do you have a net positive impact? Do you have a positive impact on our societies or do you have a negative impact? And for quite some time that actually surprised us. And we were thinking like, no, 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 let's talk about our tools because our tools are there to help you and with them you can create better societies. But recently we've learned that we need to address these, these topics because else our tools will not help anybody. And there's 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 an interesting development. Our our company is very much run on something called leadership principles, um, and we've we've always had them, and we use them to select people to work for us. But we also use them in everyday decision making all the time. Um, one of them is, for example, customer obsession, which says like we always work backward from the customer towards towards um, towards the product that we want to develop. Um, and, and so on, there are other, other leadership principles like frugality and so on. But, but only recently have we added one that realizes this, 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 this big question governments and societies are asking of us that, that you've raised. Um, and it's, let me, let me quickly just quote the first two sentences because they're in, in some way they're fun. Um, um, it says, we start in a garage, but we're not there anymore. We are big, we impact the world, and we're far from perfect. So we must be humble and thoughtful about even the secondary effects of our actions. And this type of thinking is part of what I believe or what we believe is necessary in a world where, 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 where I mean, we're of crisis, but in a world where sovereignty, sustainability, and societal impact really matter. So that's 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 maybe the perspective of um, 
of one of those those sure. multinational companies that you were alluding to at this moment in time. So, so, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, let me let me actually ask you an additional question, a follow-on question to this. Uh, in terms of privacy, now GDPR is the, thought of as the gold standard in the world right now. Many countries, including India, uh, uh, is actually trying to adopt GDPR-like principles. Uh, so is Bangladesh, and I'm sure Indonesia is also looking at some of that. So from a GDPR perspective, uh, and, and now talk from the, from the perspective of any big tech, not Amazon or Amazon Web Services, but talk from any big tech. One of the debates that we have between government and big tech is that where is the data stored? How do you ensure that data for my citizens in Bangladesh are really, I take responsibility for it, right? So if it's stored somewhere else, uh, jurisdiction of data, I think that's an important thing uh, that we need to think about. So how do you how do you ensure that? Again, don't talk from an Amazon perspective, talk from any big tech, because many big tech would actually place the data somewhere else and the jurisdiction issues really come up. And jurisdiction tied to privacy, I think, is a very complicated subject between big techs and governments. And 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 there's and, and let me make it even more complicated. There 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 is big tech that earns money or that has a business model based on using data. And there's big tech that's that's based on selling services, um, essentially selling services for cash. So I cannot talk about big tech that uses data. Think of think of social media um, where you get a, 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 a free product, but you pay essentially with your data. What I can only talk about is big tech that that sells services for cash. Um, and that that big tech um, um, or or us is 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 earning trust of the customer is is the foundation of the business there, um, ensuring that. Our customers' data stays. Our customers' data is is the most important. So, so, so we know um, they entrust their most critical and sensitive uh, um, asset to us. Um, and so, what we have to do um, is provide technical, operational, and contractual measures in order to protect the data. Mm-hmm. Right, and um, and so that's that's ensuring that the control is always be- because, as you've said, um, um, you're moving data from on premise, from essentially the basement of your ministry, to the cloud. Now, the right. cloud sounds nebulous, but it's not. The cloud is is in very specific spaces. We call that regions. So. So, so, and, and, um, and so, so for example, I'm from Germany. So I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm, I'm not very well versed in, in the regions we have in, in, in Asia. So let me, let me talk about, about, about European regions here. Um, and excuse me. And I have lots of colleagues who could talk about the other, other topic, but, but, but the, my region, um, so you as a customer decide where your data lies. In this case, um, in the console, there's a little, little flag and um, you say Frankfurt region and it will never leave that region if you don't say it should leave that region. Um, but but the control of, of, of the what region the data is in and the jurisdiction that comes with that is not the only control that you have. Mm-hmm. Essentially, luckily in technology, um, the, the place is not how we control things, but it is through um, um, technical measures such as encryption, for example. So, so you, the customer, encrypt your data, and you have the keys to the encrypted data. Um, um, that that that, for example, secures your data even if it's not in country. And there really there would be three stages you would want to look at, and you would want to do that with um, technologists. So encryption um, um, when your data data is just lying there, you, your data when it's being moved, and your data as it's being processed. That's what we call confidential computing. Um, and so these are topics. They're complicated. They're technical. In some, some they're legal. But you can work through them with the experts. And you can ensure that in any big tech company that has this type of business model that sells you a service for, um, for access um, f- to, for you to work on your data, that your data is secured and can be secured. 
So, so, so that's, that's where sovereignty, if you go back into history or sovereignty, the European concept from 16th century Baudin or so, where, which is essentially based on this idea of, um, control over territory, where sovereignty moves from control over territory to control over, over data and, and processes. Great. Mr. Milo, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think you uh, hit on several very important points. Uh, let me uh, come to our uh, uh, second panelist, uh, Mr. Salahuddin Uno, Minister from Indonesia of uh, Tourism and uh, Creative Economy. Uh, I think you have reached a stable location. I mean, thank you for joining us from your part. So, so thank you for that. So that's great. And hopefully Mr. Shashi Tharoor would also be able to join us very soon. Uh, so Minister Uno, uh, talk from the perspective of Indonesia, your country. Uh, so how do you define sovereignty as far as, as it relates to data? So talk from the perspective of government and also talk from the perspective of an Indonesian citizen. How should they look at data that they have given away supposedly to a multinational big tech company. So how do they see it, your government and you as a citizen? Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for having me. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Mr. Shashi Tarur, uh, Mr. Philip uh, Muller in Germany. Uh, danke schön. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Anir Shaudhuri for uh, moderating the sessions together with me is the deputy for industry and investments and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, sovereignty, sovereignty, sustainability and social impact discussions. Uh, nowadays uh, we are uh, basically in a data driven society. Uh, much of our policy making in the government is uh, the uh, area whereby we use big data analytics. So the uh, reality is data is something that uh, would be uh, part and parcels of all of our uh, basically facets of life. And in particular, in my field of uh, tourism and creative economy, the trend of digital tourism has been rising even before the pandemic. So you need to be open mind. You need to embrace the concept. And uh, we have AWS also data centers uh, here in Indonesia. And we, we also, because you talk about sustainability, they're actually now, because data centers use a lot of energy, uh, that we uh, we want all this uh, data uh, sovereignty concept also be coupled with uh, sustainability. Uh, and also, we think uh, even though 23 million jobs will be lost in Indonesia in the next than 20 years by way of digitalization, but there will be 46 million new jobs and better quality jobs that would follow. In particular, in the digital tourism whereby technology has surely changed how we do tourism, uh, which is more, uh, I would say, personalized, customized, localized, and smaller in size fueled by the tax savvy independent uh, travelers that emphasize on digital engagement. And also, if you look at sovereignty, the digitalization has supported the creations of many innovations, in particular uh, in the tourism space, smart travel facilitations, smart destinations, and uh, a new wave of job profile. I think the concept is uh, relatively new here, but and we have a lot of homework. Uh, and we think uh, the digital infrastructure needs to be improved 
uh, but I proof. I proof, sir, from my office to my mother home. Yes. Uh, and we did not even use the uh, the uh, actually uh, uh, because I was using my laptop. So we were tethering using my phone that actually tethered uh, to my laptop uh, mm -hmm. because with Zoom, I could do it uh, on a 4G network. But because you are using uh, a different platform than Zoom, I have to tether it. And we were able to, uh, to continue a stable communications. So these are part of Indonesia that have integrated technology into our business processes. And it shows that Jakarta is quite resilient and less compared to other parts of Indonesia impacted by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the digital divide uh, have to be bridged by more development in the infrastructures of connectivity because uh, the data sovereignty would only be able uh, to uh, bridge the digital gap with infrastructure that is widely built across the largest archipelago with around 17,000 islands. So it's a, uh, I think this is something of a transformation that would focus on not just people selling stuff online, but creating content and using data to actually uh, achieve sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. focusing on three Ps, mm -hmm. planet, people, and prosperity. Thank sure. you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Yuno. Uh, let me ask a follow-on question to Mr. Yuno. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the concern that... Uh, in, uh, Indonesian citizens have towards big tech. Could be global big tech, could be even uh, we're seeing the rise of local big techs as well, especially payment companies that are rising, e-commerce companies within your country. I'm sure you have many of those. So what is the biggest concern that a citizen of Indonesia would have regarding a big tech company? And uh, let, me, let me give you a, con a little bit of a context. So let's say uh, Unilever. So Unilever sells all kinds of products, right? Physical products, soaps and shampoos and all of that. Now, when Unilever, because of the pandemic, when shops are closed, malls are closed, Unilever starts selling is through Unilever.com. So Unilever suddenly has become Amazon, right? Because it's such a large company, it sells everything online. So let's say it's become Amazon, uh, like Amazon. So Unilever.com. So do citizens look at Unilever.com versus Unilever differently? Are there additional concerns about Unilever.com as a big tech company in Indonesia? I think the concern that uh, the people would have would be jobs. jobs. I think income, mm -hmm. inequality. Sure. I would say cost of living. I would also focus on prices. Sure. sure. Because uh, if Unilever.com would be able to create better quality jobs mm -hmm. and provide a much more affordable goods, I think net net okay. it would benefit. Although it would cut a lot of middlemen in the first place, but it would allow. I think at the end of the day, jobs as well as income and also bridging, uh, bridging, the, bridging the divide between rural and urban areas. And this is what I, I would say the biggest concern. Secondly, I would say... It's, it's, a, it's the issue of social impact then. So if, if Unilever.com is able to create a bigger social impact, reaching out to the uh, marginalized and then let's say when things are shut down, locked down, if it's able to reach the, uh, the remote islands, in the case of Indonesia, the archipelago, a better through e-commerce, then Unilever.com actually does a 
bigger social impact, right? I mean, is, would that be a fair thing to say? I would, yeah, precisely. But I was just in South Sulawesi. And the other thing that that needs to address is the sustainability part. For instance, waste. Sure. Yes, we can send Unilever products all the way to the remote islands. Sure. But I see the products, the Unilever products uh, waste uh, washed up uh, in the beach. Sure. I see sure. um, shampoo sachet sure. and wrappings of uh, soap and also plastic bottle use by Unilever products uh, that uh, have not been uh, sure. uh, managed uh, properly. And this is uh, this is just one area that we we could work together, and sure. I believe when Unilever becomes an e-commerce company, uh, customers give away their data to Unilever, which did not happen when Unilever was a was not an e-commerce company. They were selling soaps, and so so now you are giving away your privacy information to Unilever, and does that create additional concern? Just as we are discussing the concern with big tech companies such as Facebook and uh, and Google and YouTube and Amazon because you're giving away your personal data that could be used for many different uh, uh, causes, many different reasons, and you don't have control over it. So it's, a, it's, it's an issue of control of the data by the customers. Who has control? Right? We say that big techs have control, not the customers. That is the, that is the big debate. And that's why there is distrust and mistrust. There is... Uh in that uh, area, uh, general concerns, mm -hmm. but more of digital intrusions through our small ga uh, gadgets that we hold, like text SMS offering, uh, fintech products, and when you accept, there are instances, I would say this is anecdotal, but it's now growing in uh, in numbers of people having issues in relation to their loan uh, that has become a problem and the assets that they bought like a motorcycle has been uh, basically taken away from them during this very difficult time. So the means of transportation uh, those are the issues that relates to digital. In terms of the use of their prod, uh, data, uh, personal data, privacy data, uh, we, we actually use this a lot in artificial intelligence related like health tech uh, and also some uh, would have positive outcome and right. some would be, would be negative outcome and some would be neither here nor there. So my counterpart in the Ministry of Communications and Informatics mm -hmm. uh, have established uh, the data protections program. Uh, and now actually more than 150 million Indonesians have their data online because of COVID testing and tracing right. as well right. as vaccinations program. All of us now entering into any public place, travel, any uh, activities, we need to log in. And that's basically sharing all your personal data. So that's just the reality of the day in the pandemic COVID uh, era. So as government, we need to ensure that the data will not uh, be uh, uh, misused. Uh, the data will not... Uh, actually be leaked for some illegal and and uh, basically uh, uh, for the uh, I would I would say for the illicit uh, type of activities sure no, thank you thank you Mr. Uh, let me come back to you Mr. Miller uh, so Facebook is three billion people YouTube is like two billion people so they are bigger than physical nation states these days. Uh, and a claim is that the big tech wants global customers, but not really global citizens. 
who have rights. What? How do you digest that uh, thing? So uh, big techs basically want customers' data. Customers are basically the product sometimes because that's how you sell advertisements in many big tech companies. Uh, whereas uh, citizens, if, uh, if uh, a country were to give rights, specific rights to citizens, uh, and since these big techs are becoming much, much larger than countries now, and they have different types of populations in there. I've been uh, involved with, a, with an initiative called Migrant Nation, which is looking at the uh, rights of the displaced population, refugees, internally displaced people. There are about 75 million uh, people like that in the world today. That is growing to potentially half a billion uh, in the next uh, 30 years. By 2050, we may have as many as half a billion uh, displaced population, refugees and internally displaced people because of climate, because of uh, political reasons. So, so creating a digital platform for the displaced population would be another country. So how do you see big techs uh, looking at this issue? So giving uh, rights to their consumers in terms of how they control their data, how they actually have uh, uh, specification of who gets to use this data beyond what they provided the data for. So Minister Uno talked about how data is being being used across sectors. So data that was potentially used for health could potentially be used for uh, commerce related use, e-commerce. Right? So how do you draw the boundary? How should big techs think about it? And what is the role of regulation? So if you could take maybe two minutes to answer that very complicated question. <laughs> So, so, and I think Minister Uno has given us part of the answer. It's um, there is stuff that needs to be done with data by governments and governments play a role in structuring um, and always have in structuring how, how we manage life, I mean, or how we manage societies. Um, um, there are companies that have business models on, that are based on extraction of data and then using that data in order to earn money um, in, in a different space and in some sometimes that's problematic or it can be problematic but but as minister uno has said um, there there's there's the in 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 situations of health crisis for example the government um, it can be a trust anchor which which can actually um, 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 work with data um, in a way um, that no private company with personal data in a way no private company can do, but you can use the technologies that are available today, and they're available today for you um, um, at 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 the press of a button um, or on on a website. So short answer, long question. Not sure I answered everything, but back to you. <laughs> Or back, yeah, or Minister Uno, <laughs> you were going to say something. Minister Uno, so you, you address some of those issues, but let me get to a very complicated one, which is the issue of taxation uh, for global big techs. Uh, Margaret Vestager, former Deputy Danish Prime Minister for the Euro European Commission for Competition, once described Apple's tax arrangements with the Irish government as a labyrinth. Apple was paying 0.005% tax on the tens of billions of dollars in revenue from its Irish-based European subsidiary to the Irish government. Uh, recently, uh, uh, High Court in Bangladesh actually has summoned uh, the, some of the big techs here and they, they have been asked to file income tax. They have started uh, paying uh, value-added tax, VATs in Bangladesh as well. And the case is similar in many countries. What is happening in Indonesia? And how, do you, how are you holding big techs accountable for the business they do in your geography? This is very tricky, yet uh, I would say potential way of uh, democratizing the e-commerce in terms of uh, the much needed boosting of state revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this yeah. week, Minister of Finance, a very good friend of mine, uh, Sri Mulyani, Minister of Finance, sent a love letter to millions 
of uh, sellers in the um, uh, platform, the e-commerce platform like Tokopedia, which is uh, one of the giant that is actually merging with uh, Gojek, uh, you know, right. probably uh, a 40, some say a 35 to 40 billion, maybe 50 billion dollar company after the merger. But everybody got that letter saying that, hey guys, I think you need to look at your tax obligations. So it is a reminder and yet uh, uh, maybe it is a way that simplifies simplifying tax code because technology uh, should provide solution. And so far why we're facing this difficulty is because our tax code and, and I'm talking about Indonesia is too complicated and it's not able to widen the tax base and uh, improve the, the tax ratio. While technology may be the answer. Uh, people don't mind paying tax if it's not cumbersome. Uh, if it's if the use of their tax money is being used to build the country in particular education and healthcare. So I would say that uh, the tax on tech companies is, uh, is inevitable, although they will pass it to <laughs> users anyway. And as long as it doesn't really burden and increase the prices of the goods, the sure. basic commodities being traded uh, on the e-commerce platform that, that really put right. an additional burden for the people during this pandemic. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, one way that, that sure. uh, we need to improve uh, uh, going forward. It's an issue of both social impact and sustainability, company sustainability. How will they keep on running a company without uh, and if the, if taxation becomes uh, uh, too restrictive for the company to actually exist there, especially uh, locally grown companies. So one, uh, I'd like to ask uh, each of you just one minute each to have this thought, uh, which is uh, whether there could be alternatives to actually taxing directly. We are talking about a world where digital inequality is also increasing. I mean, digital is spreading but you're actually seeing some are digitally very well connected, some are not. Whether big techs can actually play a role, uh, perhaps as a taxation, not in cash, but in kind to reduce digital inequality. You want to take that? Uh, anyway. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sure, please, go ahead. Okay, number one is we support um, the the OECD tax process as as it's ongoing right now, but we think um, taxation is is the realm of governments, and we 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 support that globally. Um, number two, the the idea of like how can we use technology to leapfrog and to to develop is very de dear to my heart. And I think training, um, education and training is a big part of that. Um, and what we try to do is we, we've, we've actually just last week announced a big training program where we want to train several hundred million people in cloud technology so that they can then build businesses on top of that. Um, I think that is, that is the best way how we can use tech to leverage um, a more equal world. Um, but Minister Uno, I think you you might have a better idea than I do on, on these these things. Minister Uno, please. Um, I it's uh, I would say uh, it's something that uh, government needs to sit down with uh, big tech companies. Uh, there, there's no one. Uh, quick fix scenario we need to sit down and this is the era of FUCA I would say it, uh, volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity maybe during this uh, because of definitely profits being generated and uh, 
uh, I guess, value being created uh, to stakeholders, uh, in particular, big tech companies. Uh, Amazon, for instance, um, is the uh, market cap is almost equal to our economy. <laughs> So it's uh, it's something that uh, uh, that we need to um, find a, an equitable equitable arrangements so that each would uh, would find a structure uh, that um, that would not inhibit innovations that would continue to provide the right ecosystems conducive for uh, digitalizations and creating a stronger ecosystem for digital economy, but yet fair uh, to, uh, I guess, Indonesia is, is very, very firm uh, in terms of um, uh, providing a good uh, trajectory in order for us to achieve a developed nation by 2045. That means we need to increase GDP per capita, we need to reduce inequality, we need to meet sustainable development goals target, and that's only would be able if we work with, with uh, the, the, the big tech companies. And I think technology could provide some of those answers. So. Uh, and my, team, my my colleagues in the Ministry of Finance working, I think, uh, and we have a very uh, cordial and constructive discussions with big tech companies, including uh, uh, AWS uh, as well as AWS continue to invest here, and we uh, we would like to welcome more investments uh, because we need uh, the uh, actually the digital. Um, infrastructures to to be built here uh, so this 270 million of populations will continue to have uh, a good uh, runway uh, into 2045 whereby that's 100 year anniversary independence of Indonesia whereby we want to achieve uh, the fourth largest economy of the world. Great, wonderful. Thank you Minister Uno. So both uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Uno talked about several very important things. Uh, I'd like to end with the, the concept of VUCA that Mr. Uno talked about. This is increasingly becoming a world which is VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And as we form policies uh, between governments and the big techs, because big techs also have a role in policy formulation. They are a beneficiary and also they have to respond to and comply with policies and uh, standards set by the government. So it's really a shared challenge and a shared solution that we have to come up with. So therein lies the concept of a gray policy. So Minister Uno talked about a potentially premature policy and regulation stifling innovation. Sometimes we actually may not know. And this is always a balancing act with digital sovereignty needs, measuring social impact, and company sustainability issues. It's really a balancing act between the private sector and the government that has to be uh, balanced in the context of that country. And therein, I think that concept of a great policy, a policy that actually dynamically changes with the needs of the country, needs of the citizens, consumers, and the big techs. That's what we should be looking at. So we're in Bangladesh, we're also exploring this great policy issue, that policy that's not set rigidly in space and time for a long time, but that can actually adapt uh, based on changing needs, based on changing understanding and uh, negotiation between uh, private sector and the government. So with that, I'd like to uh, close this session. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller and uh, Minister Uno, uh, for your valuable time. And Mr. Uno, especially, you've been, uh, I think you've been traveling and you've been with us throughout this entire time. Thank you very much for that. Really for your Thank you very much and look forward to meeting you in per yes, person in the not so distant future. Thank you, Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Mr. Ona and Mr. Miller, thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye.